think that's what this episode is all about. It's just a recap of the year. And so some of this stuff doesn't always make the final cut, although it could be quite interesting. We were driving the other day and we saw this, this frenzy of jackals. This particular insect is the dung beetle. Vitally important, really interesting, and this is them. Shimwari TV fans. I think that's what I have to call everyone now because of how well we've done over the last year and I think that's what this episode is all about. It's just a recap of the year and and where we've come from and where we are now and, and some of the amazing things that we've seen. It certainly has been a memorable year, not necessarily one we all want to remember but although it's had its challenges there has been positives that have come out of it as well. I initially started a, a, a short little lockdown series that I thought would last for 21 days and, and do a couple of episodes and out of it has come this, uh, this amazing concept, Shimwari TV and it's, uh, it really has snowballed and uh, it's educational, it's fun, it's had amazing feedback so we've really enjoyed it. We've seen some amazing things, incredible sightings, uh, the, the, the time that we get to spend out in the bush watching animals and filming and, and just I mean the beauty that we are surrounded by at all times has, has just been so amazing so I'm really thankful for that. As I'm driving now, just thinking back at a couple of the things that we've seen this year, we've seen hyenas for example. Our brown hyena episode where we, we went and we scratched around the den and we, we had a look at some of the, the bones that were around there, we were able to identify species that they were feeding on, the habits of these guys, how they live, where they live. Obviously Cindy told us some amazing facts about them and uh, that was pretty cool so have a look. I think this is one of the big differences between spotted hyena and brown hyena in that, correct me if I'm wrong, but the brown hyena are bringing back a whole bunch of food that they've scavenged from all over the reserve to, to bring back to the den site. Is there, what's the main reason for that? I think the main reason is because they can easily be killed and predated on by lions. So if they spend time feeding at the site, they have a risk of getting killed. Usually hyenas that has uh, youngsters won't go with them to look for food, so they're going to have to bring food back for them. Like male hyenas, for instance, they don't have a fixed den site and they'll just be nomadic and sleep under bushes, so they might drag it into the nearest bush. They have certain areas they like to hang out, but they could be anywhere and they might not collect like this. But because they've got babies here, obviously they're not going to take the bones away. They build a nice little shrine. And how, how long do you think this den has been active? Because this is, this is quite an accumulation of bones. This is actually, I would say, about four years ago. We've been monitoring this den site for about two and a half years. Started building their own little thing here over time. You can always see the horns remain. There's probably not much for them to chew on, but mm. the skull is always gone because the good stuff is in there and yeah, lions get don't get brain. to get in there. Yeah. And so it really is nature's recycler. Yeah, phenomenal jaw strength to be able to even Just think about crunching through a whole bunch of these bones. And this den site is extensive. I mean, we, we're talking there mm -hmm. might be, what, do you know how many animals are here? Maybe 10? So at the moment it's a mother and her previous season's youngster and then she had two more. The most that I've seen here at the same time was four for this particular den site. When we see the puppies Oh, the cubs play here in front of the camera. It is tossing stuff like horns around, but it's just like a dog. They also have that playful nature where they roll around and they annoy mum. You can really see she's just lying there and they're just all over her. And Cindy, tell me what, uh, what research are you getting from this? Is there stuff that we, we obviously, as a, a conservation body, always keen to contribute to data and, and uh, information that goes out? So what, what's the point of, of uh, all the research that goes on here? I think 
We're not submitting this to any scientific paper or study, but it's always important. It shows the value of the reserve if they are able to say, I'm not just focusing on lions and the big stuff I have. Our reserve actually has a very big role in conserving the smaller things in nature. It shows that we've got a really healthy population of brown hyena just with the amount of pastings, the amount of uh, scat sites, and through camera trapping, picking up uh, where they move on the reserve. So that shows us already, we, we can't say how many we have, but it, we've got a very healthy population and I think it plays a very big role. So this is the only way to really get up close and personal and actually see what do they get up to at night, what time do they leave in the morning, what time do they come back, because you can pick that up on camera traps, which is really cool. As you know, some of the best sightings I've had have been on foot. I really, really enjoy spending time walking in the bush and experiencing nature on foot. I think it, it gives you a completely different perspective in nature. Yeah, I mean, one of the walks we had this year was uh, into that male lion on foot. That was absolutely amazing sighting. So as we've come over this little ridge over here, just making our way along the river line over there, there's a beautiful male lion that's lying on the edge of the, the opposite river bank, looking down into the river line. There's a couple of other animal species around here. There's the impala over there, uh, springbuck up this side over here. There's, there's a lot of tracks that we saw earlier of the rest of the pride, but I don't think they're around here. So I think this is actually going to make quite a nice approach. We'll use the, the bush cover. We're just going to move a little bit closer and uh, we'll view him from the opposite side of the river and see his reactions to us on here. So we're at a, about 100 meters now, maybe just under 100 meters. And he's got quite a nice vantage point. I don't see any tail flicking or anything like that. So he's actually just quite super chilled and just busy watching us. A lot of the time how you approach animals will dictate how their comfort zones around them increase in size or shrink in size. So just listening out for other noises around me. Uh, often if you walk directly at an animal, they perceive that to be quite a direct threat towards them. If you meander slowly or uh, even sometimes do like zigzag type stuff or spend time looking at a bush or something like that on the way to the animal, it very often takes the focus off of them and they'll relax down quite nicely like this guy. So we've, uh, we've managed to move a tiny, tiny little bit closer. We're down to about 60 meters, which is, um, I think, as close as we're going to be able to get in this river rind bush. So I'm not going to overstay my welcome, but it is awesome to spend any time with lions on foot. They're the king of the jungle and an apex predator for a reason. So beautiful sighting of the, that big male lion, king of the jungle. One of the other amazing walking segments we did was actually our first episode when we changed over from lockdown series to Shimori TV and that was the hippo walk. That was really fun and I think that was my, my first real introduction to, uh, to Shimori TV with you guys and, and to getting to where we are now. Definitely not going to overstay our welcome. They did pick up on us quite quickly as we were moving through this thick bush. I think uh, we 
because the hippos are quite concentrated because of the drought. Uh, they are a little bit on the edge, they are feeling a little bit more vulnerable and uh, obviously my, my primary intention is not to put any pressure on these guys. As you can see as we've just sat here nice and quietly for a little bit so they've calmed down as well. A bunch of them are starting to go back to sleep again so they're getting nice and relaxed. These, uh, these hippo pods are made up of territorial bulls and uh, that territorial bull then has a group of females and, uh, and their calves. And when, uh, when you go into periods of, of drought or there's a shortage of food or anything like that, so competition increases. And the ones that get affected the most are actually your young hippo bulls, three-year-old, four-year-old uh, hippo bulls. Like they're not old enough to have their own territories yet. They can't compete against the big bulls. And so they get pushed out of their territories. And they become these nomadic guys who often get quite badly wounded in fighting. But they can succumb to their wounds and die. If you look at that one sticking his mouth out of the water, you can see those long sensory hairs and it's those hairs that we managed to see on the tracks this morning on the pathway as we were walking down. Hippos have the unbelievable ability to, to actually sleep in water. They obviously can't breathe underwater but they are able to sleep in water as you can see now most of them are sleeping. Every now and again you'll see some of them go below water. As they go down automatically their nostrils will close, their ears fold back, close and they'll go down and they, on average, will stay under for about a minute. They'll then come up again, breathe, the ears will shake and close up again and then under. And they can just do that on a natural cycle. It's quite, quite natural for them, quite comfortable. So these guys have relaxed down nicely. They're all sleeping again. I'm not going to overstay my welcome. I think I'm pretty safe up here at the moment, but uh, I don't want to put any pressure on these animals. So I'm going to move out. One of the gems about nature and working on a game reserve is you never know what's going to happen next. There's a surprise around every corner. Earlier on in the year we, we had headed out to, uh, I can't remember, we had maybe gone out to film a, a giraffe and we, we completely were unprepared for as we went down into a drift the next thing there was pride of lions and there was a springbok kill and there was just action everywhere and it's just, you know, things evolve and happen so quickly. And yeah. it's about just being prepared for it. And, and we ended up with an amazing segment of the, the lions on a springbok kill. I think that's the amazing thing about the bush and, and Shamwari is you never know what you're going to see. Uh, we literally, we climbed in a vehicle, we've driven for three minutes. And as we came into our first river crossing around the corner here, we sit with the pride of lions on a kill. Uh, it's completely unexpected. And every time you go out, you're going to see something different. So most of the pride has now moved off. There's already a lot of activity with the lions in terms of playing with one another, pouncing. So quite clearly there's not a, a massive amount of meat that went around, but they're starting to get active and stalk one another and play and uh, just being all sociable again at the end of, a, end of a quick breakfast. Very often with the youngsters anyway, small bits of the kill will be turned into a bit of a trophy in a game. These two youngsters saw this guy moving off with a whole bunch of the skin and this is now where lions are getting playful. You will see these lions start playing, chasing one another and, and one of them will have this little trophy, whether it be a part of a leg or a foot or something like that or a hoof and they'll be running around chasing one another and this little morsel becomes the, the prize and uh, again there will be a lot of acrobatics and jumping and it's all very important, it's all uh, learning behaviour 
it's, it's all developmental stuff and it's teaching lions capabilities of what they can do and a lot of it is almost reenactment of behaviors that they would use in an in a actual kill. As they're busy running and the one chases the other one, how that uh, foot is always coming up trying to do a typical uh, lion hold catch and it's, it's these games that they play as youngsters that are teaching them how to hunt later on in life. See the young cubs are still quite speckled with the, the dark brown splotching. It helps with camouflage when they're very tiny. As they get older, they'll lose most of it. The females will retain some of it, but it'll almost completely be gone. And then obviously the males don't have much at all. And there's the pounce on the back. That is so vital for them when they're learning how to hunt and when they are actually executing a hunt later on in life. Pouncing onto the back of a zebra or a kudu or even a big animal like a buffalo that we've seen so many times. As she's stalking up on this one, how the ears go down, lowering her profile. This is typical, it's play behavior, but this is what's teaching them how to hunt later on in life. Then we got a... <laughs> We got a springbok leg as the as the trophy, and now that's going to turn into a game. Another way you always get surprised is long distance sightings. You know, you might see something out in the distance, and you think one thing, and you either get a little bit closer or use your binoculars to scan, and you see it's something else. We saw a, what I thought was a white rhino at distance as it was out in the open field and it actually turned out to be a black rhino that was moving from one set of thickets to the next but it was just really early morning and that, uh, that led to the most amazing black rhino sighting. So about a minute ago, just higher up on the ridge behind me, I got long distance visual of a very nice white or light colored shiny object moving into a bush. Grab my binox quickly and just managed to catch the, the end of it and it looked like a black rhino. So we, there we go, there we go. And, yep, that's a black rhino. So we are super lucky. Once the heat of the day picks up, these guys generally move into thicker bush. Awesome is that. So you can see a little bit smaller than the white rhino, slightly smoother, and a much rounder little barrel shaped head. Where the white rhino has such a long square shaped head. And you can see that very prehensile lip that it uses to selectively prune off the little bits of twigs and leaves. So a much more compact animal than the the white rhino, but way more cantankerous. Generally at the first sign of you on foot, they'll come and investigate. So they, they are what we term a lot more aggressive. I do tend to think it's a little bit more nervous. So one of the things that can be a bit deceptive when they're busy walking is the head can be a little bit lower, which from a distance can give it a, a white rhino appearance. So it's always good just to double check these things because if you are on foot and want to approach, a black rhino is not, not the easiest animal to deal with on foot. Generally once they are charging, white rhino will generally veer off or, or you can actually quite easily get them to stop. But the black rhino tend to actually follow through with the charges, so you have to be very careful with them on foot. So there's such a list of iconic animals out in the bush. We spent time with a breeding herd of elephants, pretty much a whole day with them, just watching how they live as a social cohesive unit, how they feed, how they just survive in the bush and they manage their lives. It's just amazing. So your elephant society is based off of a matriarchal herd system. In other words, the the females lead the herd. It's the, the core group of elephant society is the females and their offspring babies, youngsters. And then the outer fringes of that, you have the bulls and the little groups of males sticking together. Core society is led and dominated by your female. In particular, a matriarch, she's the oldest uh, elephant in the herd. 
and uh, she'll have direct relatives, sisters, cousins, and all of their offspring. And the matriarch basically will lead the herd on a daily basis, initiate all the movements to feeding, water, larger aggregations when groups of elephants get together that uh, along the line have been related to one another and when they get too big in a herd they'll then split and then these micro little smaller groups of breeding herds will then eventually form and, and become a nucleus on their own but they will from time to time come together and they form these little aggregation you know like family reunions I mean it's a, a lot of elephant behavior in my opinion anyway can be very much transferred onto human behavior in terms of disciplining family values and a lot of the ages are very similar you know elephant lifespan and human lifespan is very similar so a lot of the time when you're busy filming or you you have a plan in mind and you're on your way to film one thing uh, nature nature doesn't care about the schedule nature doesn't care about your program or what you think you want to go and film and often you'll be on your way to film something and the next thing something else happens and, and you need to make a plan so some of this stuff doesn't always make the final cut, although it could be quite interesting. For example, we've seen giraffe busy necking, and uh, we haven't really discussed that in depth yet. Uh, the other day we were on our way to film leopard and we ended up watching giraffe for a little while that were busy, uh, busy necking, which is essentially just two young bulls starting to establish their dominance, learning how to fight, and uh, although it can be quite graceful, it can turn quite brutal at times with giraffe. And that's all to establish dominance, in the hope of one day being able to be the top male that eventually gets to mate and pass on his genes. So it's always great to see how opportunistic nature is. And every time there's an opportunity, you'll see a, a list that starts, the, I suppose, the pecking order. When nature provides an opportunity, you just have to be there and watch the action unfold. We were driving the other day and we saw this, this frenzy of jackals. And uh, anytime nature uh, or animals are in a frenzy, it means there's, a, there's an opportunity there. And there just happened to be a, an explosion of alates, basically the reproductive potentials of termites as they were, uh, as they were leaving the, the termite colony to go and start new colonies. And an and a alate is just jam-packed with protein. And any time protein in nature is, uh, is abundant, you're going to find animals that want to feed off of it, and in a hurry as well. And that's what these jackals were doing. They were trying to cram as much of these alates into them as possible, eat as much as they can to get as much protein as possible. And once they moved off, things like Cape Glossy starlings moved in, the fork-tailed drongos, even other smaller raptors like pale chanting goshawks will take that as an opportunity and, and just feed off of it on mass, so also great to see. So from the biggest animals to some of the smallest animals, even little insects have their place and can be fascinating to watch and, and in fact really interesting in their behavior, their habits, what they do and how important they are. Everything has a place in nature. Everything forms a very, very vital part in that link and without it there would be trouble. This particular insect is the dung beetle. Vitally important, really interesting and this is them. So this Adophytus dung beetle is really such a special little creature. They are actually very, very rare. They are restricted to a few populations in South Africa. And there's a number of reasons for that. Number one is they are flightless. So 
they can't travel large distances like a number of other insects can really quickly. A female only lays one egg, sometimes very, very rarely two eggs if conditions are 100% right for the year, but otherwise it's one egg and therefore one youngster per year. And that youngster takes about four months to develop, hatch and develop into an adult. And it's quite interesting what happens is the, the female uh, will select dung, and in this case they're quite species specific. They'll feed off of elephant dung, they'll feed off of baboon dung as we've seen, but they prefer nesting and laying their eggs in their, in their brood ball uh, with buffalo dung. So to have a combination of that dung found together is one of the reasons why you don't find these dung beetles everywhere in South Africa anymore. Obviously habitat destruction and elimination of most of those animals over wide areas have limited this dung beetle to a few very, very small populations in South Africa. So let's have a look at a couple of the features that make dung beetles dung beetles. Most of them have this really, really phenomenal shape at the front of them where it's almost like a, a shovel a snout that allows them to tunnel and dig through the dung and bury almost like a, a spade or a shovel so perfectly adapted if you have a look at their front legs over here very very powerful and they come inwards and uh, they have this comb structure on the outside which allows them to rake separate and then pat down into a ball the dung long back legs so that when they're pushing the dung ball away they'll push it with their hind legs like that and they orientate themselves with the Sun and the stars None the worse for wear. Let's put her back in that little spot over here and she can bury down into the dung. Leave her there. Shamwari is home to all of the iconic big cats that you find out in the bush. You've got lion, you've got cheetah, and of course, what could be more iconic than the leopard? It was really a process that we spent tracking this guy, learning his habits, and trying to eventually catch up with him until we did and we found him on a blessed book kill. That was really special. It actually looks like he's feeding on something over there. He's in quite a thick bush clump. And just in this bush over here, I can see that it definitely looks like a piece of meat. Now, the thing about leopards is they, they're pretty shy. I don't want to get too close. I don't want to put any pressure on the animal. The leopards are known to, if they, if they have a kill, they'll cache it. Uh, well, they, you know, they'll stick it in trees or under thick bushes and they'll feed off of it for a few days. So if we put any pressure on the animal and chase him off, we put him at a disadvantage. So I definitely want to keep my distance here. As he's busy feeding on the carcass on that blast block over there, you can hear him using what's known as a carnassial shear. And this is what makes predators so efficient and their ability to, to get to tough meat or sinew or bone. And it's basically paired up premolars and molars that pair up that form almost like a scissor-like action that allow them to get and shear meat off of the bone and allow them to cut up meat into chunks before swallowing it. So as we've seen with this guy now, he's taken down a blessed block. He's pulled it into a bush clump, whether he, I'm not sure exactly where he would have caught that animal, but he's pulled it into that bush clump, obviously to protect it, to try and uh, keep it out of the peeking eye of any scavengers, whether it be jackals, crows, vultures, anything like that. He wants to try and keep it protected so that he can feed off of it for as long as possible. If we compare that to lions, for example, lions will also catch blessbok. Generally, lions are within a pride. That blessbok in its entirety would be gone within <laughs> within two, three hours, given our uh, prides of lions on Shamwari. So they would absolutely demolish that, uh, that carcass very, very quickly, and then they would move on. All you would find is possibly a part of the skull, lower jaw sometimes, a couple of vertebrae, and you know, the, the lions would even get through most of the ribs on a blessed box. Whereas the leopard can be quite selective in what he eats. Generally, they start going for the inside of the legs, the meat on the inside of the rump, uh, into the internal organs, a lot of the, the high nutritional value stuff. And then if he's able to stay off for that longer, then you'll just consume more and more of the meat until, until most of it's gone. They will eat quite putrid meat as well sometimes. We, we find kills that are many days old with leopards still busy feeding off of it. So now that he's finished having a good feed off of that, what looks like a blessed kill, he uh, 
He's covered up with uh, a whole bunch of branches and leaves and twigs and that, like a, like a typical domestic cat would have done, covering something up. Your leopard often cover up a, a kill uh, as a way of, of them trying to secure the kill for longer, trying to make sure that it's not sp spotted from the air by any aerial scavengers, vultures, crows, try and mask the scent as much as possible so that they'll be able to spend as, as long as possible on the, on the carcass to, to utilize all of the meat to its maximum. The longer he can maintain control over the carcass, the more he can utilize the meat, the better it is and the, the longer it'll be before he needs to hunt again. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that has uh, been along for this journey. The initial startup of Shamari TV, where we've gotten to, how it's evolved, and we're really looking forward to 2021, what it's going to bring, and all the amazing sightings that we're going to see. Uh, I really hope that you're going to join us for the ride, so uh, enjoy it and be safe. We'll see you next year. Hello everyone, my name's Andrew Kearney. I'm the Ranger Manager at Shamari Private Game Reserve. I just want to take a moment to say thank you very much for all the support and feedback that we've been getting on our brand new channel, Shamwari TV. If you haven't followed us yet, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you right here at Shamwari Private Game Reserve.